always comes back around though. You you get what you give. If you <laughs> you give empathy, somebody might come back later and save your life and give you an opportunity of a lifetime. So you you have to be mindful. You have to have emotional well, I'm intelligence. Waiting for that wheel to come. You're, Same. You're, you're going. Same. You know. <laughs> when does it come? <laughs> you get what no. you give for real. Yeah, and I do have to agree with Joe here. Um, my parents gave me up for adoption when I was 13. So I lived in foster care uh, with my three younger siblings who I took care of. Um, so I knew, same, I had a survival plan. I was gonna age out of the system at 16, adopt my three younger siblings and raise them. That's how Chicago, the state of Illinois works. You can do that. Um, so for me, I'm very similar. I am used to not having a support system. It actually makes me uncomfortable that my, my boyfriend of 10 years will help me and I'm like, I didn't ask for help. <laughs> right. Get out of here. <laughs> dude, 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 dude. <laughs> I can handle myself. <laughs> but, um, so it is hard because, and I, and I can, I have to applaud this woman here. She has, I've known her for almost 20 years. Um, she has come to me in some of my hardest times. I haven't even told her they were my hardest times, but she was just there and she's like, how are you? And even that makes a world of a difference because it took me a little while to understand what empathy truly was because I didn't have it, so how am I supposed to give it if I don't know what it feels like? Um, you know, that type of stuff. So it, it is, it's hard um, because I am still in that situation where, you know, if I don't have tolerance for you, if I don't have empathy, chances are I don't care about your anything and I'm just going to do my own thing. However, I am learning and I am trying to be better. And you all, and both of you all, I'm just gonna say this sound very hard, but you guys are some of the best people. Sure. And so I'm complimenting you and I'm sorry Thank if you feel you. uncomfortable. But <laughs> well, it's, I'm sure, it's real. I'm sure Joe can relate, but when it comes to, you know, trying to help when your cup is empty, I unfortunately am someone who I will continue to let it go into the negative to help right. someone else and then I will inevitably hit a wall, but it's not good, I know. It's not good. So we, this, is, this is good. I, I really enjoyed you all, um, this conversation. I want to, uh, we're going to hand it over to the audience here in a second. But I have a couple questions. I just want to leave, this is just rhetorical questions I want to leave with you all um, to ask ourselves, right, before we say and do things, when we interact with people. Do I know why the person is doing something from their perspective and not mine? Have I sought to understand that perspective by asking questions and listening to the actual answers, right? Mm -hmm. um, without preconceived notions or imposing my weight or trauma to it. Am I measuring the amount of empathy I give out based on my own biases, judgment, and convictions? Do I have the full context of the situation or just a snapshot, right? And sometimes we just get these little snapshots like what our friends give us, they give us snapshots. Um, am I able to separate myself from my ego, drop the need to be right, or the appearance of being intelligent to allow myself to be more empathetic? Um, should I receive the very thing I deny to others, right? Should I deny others the very thing that I crave? We all, we all wanna be understood. As much as we, you know, we wanna be loved, we wanna be accepted, and should I deny that to somebody else, right? If it's something that I want, quite naturally, they may want it too. Mm -hmm. So that is my ending. Um, you know, since Jerry Springer is gone, I have to do a, 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 a call of the day. <laughs> so, um, so. Don't compare yourself no, to Jerry no. Springer, dude. Jerry Springer is from Ohio, like me, so I, you know, Cincinnati. So, um, yeah, it was getting a little heavy. So I'm like, no. So we're gonna have, we're gonna have some. Um, some audience questions. If anybody wants to uh, ask a question to the panelists or make a statement. That dress is so pretty. Yeah, she looks so oh my God. Hello? Oh. <laughs> Hi, y'all. So, my question I guess I need a little bit of background. Um, I am a cancer survivor, so for me, I feel like a lot of people give me sympathy instead of empathy, mm. and am I misconstruing, misconstruing it to it being sympathy instead of empathy? I guess, like, where's the line, and what would we consider empathy, and what do we consider sympathy? Mm. Oh, mm -hmm. that's a great question. question. So, if I may Please. go first. Um, yeah. 
I completely understand um, the question because I, I have rarely found someone who's gone through the things I have gone through. So typically when someone, you know, here's my story, I'm very transparent with, with my story. Uh, you know, they'll say, oh, that's so horrifying. I can't believe someone lived through that. I'm so sorry. I see that as sympathy because they have identified the fact that they have not lived through that. And so, but they're still saying, I hear you and I'm sorry that you had to go through that. Whereas empathy is more along the lines of, you know, I have been there. Here's what helped me. Please let me know how I can help you kind of thing. So there's more of that self-identification and similar circumstance that I've gone through that. Um, I think both are good to have, but it, it is easier when you have someone who can empathize with you because it's easier to explain those those thoughts, those feelings, those things like that. And, and we can show we can still show empathy mm -hmm. even though we haven't experienced it, right? Mm -hmm. We can still okay, yeah. Sure. Um, thank you. I also think that uh, hey, empathy empowers you, right? Uh, so when I interact with my Uh, when I interact with my clients, I come from two lenses. Uh, one, I have to advocate for them, or can they advocate for themselves, and all I have to do is be their cheerleader, right? Hey, you need to do this, you need to get this, this is how you do it, this is what you got to do, blah, 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 X, Y, Z. Uh, but I can sympathize. So, uh, again, sympathy is exactly what my girl here just said and Aaron, and I think empathy is the part where... Uh, I haven't experienced it, but I want to empower you, and here's how we're going to do it. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. Thank you for your question. Hi, Mom. Hi. <laughs> You're doing good. <laughs> um. I guess I kind of thought of this question mostly for my mom, but obviously everyone here can talk about it. And I just want to know, on the topic of empathy and tolerance, how has having me and my little brother in your life affected your empathy and tolerance? Don't cry. Don't no, cry. No, you've done. <laughs> don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> you've been I doing so good. <laughs> I knew that my baby was going to talk. I knew that if she got the microphone and got a chance, she would have something to say. But obviously, like, you know, like, they have completely changed my life. Yeah. And, and through COVID quarantine and through mental health struggles and issues, my I remember my son was like in the four year program at the Memorial Presbyterian and his little um, end of the year um, meeting with the teacher was, she literally said to me, I don't know if he's a genius or if he needs special help. Mm. And I was like, yeah. I was start, was went home and was crying to my husband and I'm like, what do I do with this? I don't know what to do with this. And then finally we decided we'd just go with the genius yeah, you know, why we'll not? Go, <laughs> if you get to pick, <laughs> right. if you get to pick, you know, so. But, and then kindergarten was a struggle because the kindergarten teacher probably, you know, should have been teaching college and not kindergarten. But uh, moving on, in first grade was like, you know, the teacher was like, my son has ADD or ADHD, and I, I really think you need to have your son tested. So we went through, through the whole process of having him tested for that. And then I obviously, I, if it's not clear, struggle with several issues, including mental health issues. And my daughter has had, you know, acute trauma and has struggled with mental health issues. And quarantine exacerbated those issues. Oh, sure. like Absolutely. For me personally, I have, was diagnosed with like mild agoraphobia, which means you can't leave your house. And so for uh, quarantine to me was delightful. <laughs> uh, I mean, after, after I got, went out, I was you know, the I, I went saying, out I was like, the I porch know. and I was like, here it is. It's the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> like it's, it's the apocalypse and I'm not going to survive. But then a couple of months later, I was like the healthiest I have ever been in my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't catch any colds from the little kids and I didn't, you know, I felt wonderful and it was amazing. But for my 
teenager and my preteen, like they both were affected differently by quarantine sure. and one oh, yeah. did okay with it and the other one, it exacerbated every struggle and every issue and it was yeah. very hard to overcome that. So here, here's getting to the answer is that with my son, my husband really, my, you know, bootstraps, West Texas, Friday night lights, football man, ex-football, you know, jock. And we were like, rub some dirt on it. You'll be fine. Get, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And then when you get to the point where your child has an issue and you know as a, as a PhD, as a scientific man, that that child that is beyond that child, that child cannot control that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> That's eye-opening. Mm -hmm. That's eye-opening. Yep. So you have to change. You have to, your back is against the wall and you have to change for your kids. Yeah. You have to adapt yeah. and grow and learn and change and be empathetic and have mm -hmm. tolerance for their issues. And my daughter has just, has just like changed us for in so many ways. Her issues have forced us into the deepest, darkest areas of our lives and to the highest heights. And we have had to take classes and we've had to go to family therapy and we have all learned so much and grown so much yeah. and elevated to the next level and the next level. And it is, Amazing. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate Great. you for it. Um, Great work. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, transparency is um, therapeutic as well, right? Mm -hmm. Being honest with ourselves right. and our experiences. Ooh. And you know what's interesting is something that you said that really uh, stuck out to me. Um, I mean, a lot of stuff that you said stuck out. Um, but one thing in particular is how with children, Get, we, we are empathetic, right? So we say, oh, it's a child. And we kind of do the work to help adapt and, and help them, right? And then I think sometimes we forget that these children grow up to be adults, right? And then we lose that sense of wanting to understand them more. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm glad that we're able to have this discussion, you know, because sometimes we can look at that person and say, oh, that, that was, that's, you know, that child we had, right? That happened just like things that happened to us as children they're still with us sometimes. And I think that's a good way sometimes for me anyway to look at people and look at that child and, right. and say, you know, this is a child that grew up filled with some heavy stuff, right? There's a little, I we deal with things with humor, I believe, like I do, but you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, who hurt you? Yeah. And you look at someone and like, and that's like an old little comedy saying or whatever, like, who, who hurt you, honey? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. what, in, and it's real, what, right? Right, and so yeah. sometimes, I, I have more empathy now than I used to, I believe, if someone's going off in the Walmart or something, in I'm like, who, yeah. who hurt you? What, yeah. ha are you okay? You know, yeah. <laughs> are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> Can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good job. <laughs> um, I have a two-part question. One, do you think everyone is deserving of empathy? Mm. And two, if so, how do you show empathy but also maintain boundaries with people who are unsafe in your life? Such a good question. Can, can I answer that one? Yeah. That's that's oh, is. thank yeah. you. Is that Tay that um, I didn't study for that one, Tay. <laughs> <laughs> Does, okay, does everybody deserve empathy? Yes, as long as they are willing to listen. Um, I feel like if you are not, and this, this could be a controversial answer as well, if you are not willing to sit there and listen, then I don't think you deserve empathy. And that's, again, going back to that selfish thing. Um, and keeping those people out of your life, I just do it. You know, it's, it's a very unfortunate circumstance that you do have to kind of exile people from your life, um, especially if it's, it, if it's people that are close to you. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I do have some people in my life personally that, uh, you know, they, they're, they, they agree with my life choices. But uh, during the Black Lives Matter movement, um, while I was out protesting, they were at home you know, putting things on Facebook, being a keyboard warrior, mm -hmm. um, talking about how 
you know, the, uh, the, the kneeling at these, at these sporting events shouldn't be happening, and it makes you a terrible person to be kneeling. And it's like, but you don't understand what they're going through. And I have cut those people out of my life. And let me tell you why. My life has been so much better. Yes. Um, <laughs> because I don't have to sit here and listen to their bigotry. You know, knowing that these people that were in my life, they're, they're never going to change. They're never going to change their ideas um, until maybe one day they go through it. You know, and I'll tell you right now, these people aren't going to go through it because they are whiter than white. <laughs> that, that privilege is there. Um, so th so that, that change is never going to happen. So yeah. I think... Uh, oh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Nope. Uh, uh, similar. Um, I lost both my parents and uh, I lost my dad in 2021 and my mom six months later. And I wasn't talking to either one of them when they both passed. Eh? And uh, I'm a, compli a complicated person because I grant more empathy and tolerance to complete strangers than I do those that are close to me. And it's because I hold those close to me to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. Just like I think that those of us that have an education, do social work, none of you are brave enough to be a cop, any of that stuff, you too should be held to a higher standard because you have that social hierarchy. And it's all about social capital. However, I do have boundaries, eh? And I'm very clear about those boundaries. And just like my man here said, uh, if you're not willing to listen, and it's like that kid that I told, hey, don't touch that plate. And what do they do? They go touch that plate. And I told them three times that plate was hot. I'm not going to feel sorry for that kid that's got a little burn on his hand, eh? What I'm going to do is say, I told you so. Um, it's very similar. You have to set those boundaries or you're just going to constantly be in a conflict. And toxicity is just not going to help you to allow pe uh, help people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you're really same story. <laughs> Uh, so when I was adopted, we had an open adoption. So our, my biological parents were still an active part of our lives if we chose that. Um, unfortunately, my biological father passed in 2021 and I am the next of kin. So I was contacted after not speaking to this man for 13 years that I had to make some decisions. Now those are boundaries I set. My younger siblings had relationships with him and that's fine. Um, but I had no empathy. I had no tolerance. I had no ounce of anything. But for some reason, when I let down that boundary and I had to go and be faced with this circumstance in my face and sign papers and do this and that, all of a sudden it was like an overwhelming empathy just took over my, I literally called my therapist that night, my trauma therapist, and I was like, I don't know what I'm feeling, but I don't like it. Yeah. Um, can you help me? <laughs> so because it, it truly was like overwhelming. So I think it's hard because I personally don't think everyone is deserving of empathy. Um, some are just tolerant. Some deserve that at least. And some don't deserve either. But you do have to be willing to set that boundary of a cut and dry, either a, I'm just going to talk to you when I have to talk to you, or I'm not going to talk to you at all. Because once that boundary comes down, it is very overwhelming. Um, I can't even explain it. It was just a very overwhelming feeling, to, to say the least. So... Does anybody else want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question, right? Because um, sometimes you can, for me, you can set boundaries and be empathetic, mm -hmm. right? I mm -hmm. mean, you can do both, right? Where you can um, have empathy towards that person, but still not, you know, have them in your proximity. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always ask myself that when I, uh, you know, when someone says that somebody's deserving, I then ask, you know, wonder if somebody made that gets to make that decision for me, right? What mm -hmm. if they get to say, well, she's not deserving of that. You know, would that be, would that be fair? Would that be easy? Would that be right? You know, so I always try to ask those questions back to myself and say, you know, if other people got to decide if I should, you know, experience compassion, empathy, you know, so. Way to be a Debbie Downer. <laughs> We're all wrong, is what she's saying. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just playing. <laughs>
thank you all so much for the honesty and openness. Yeah. Um, I have a question for y'all. It's kind of a hard question, I think. Um, I am originally from the South, grew up in Florida, went to school in South Carolina, um, grew up in a Catholic family, so religion and faith was very important to me. Uh, moved to Chicago in 2007 and dated a guy for the first time and found two parts of my life in a lot of conflict. And in that atmosphere, I was kind of, I got the vibes of like, dude, you got to choose, you know? And a lot of the, the atmosphere was very kind of, you know, anti-church, like step away from that, like it's full of hate. And, and I didn't feel like anybody understood my conflict. And, you know, I actually, I did not support same-sex marriage. Uh, it was not something that I believed in. And I wasn't the only, you know, gay person at the time who, who thought that way. I knew a number of different people who had those thoughts because of the time and space that we grew up in. Sure. Um, and being at a pride parade uh, for the first time and seeing you know, churches and congregations marching and taking part kind of showed me that there was actually a space for this perspective to be heard, that I didn't have to put these things into conflict. And I eventually came, to, came around. Like I support same-sex marriage now, of course. Um, so the question I wanted to ask y'all was, is there anything in your life that has made you kind of change your mind? Have you changed your mind about something and has somebody's empathy been at the root of that change? Or has that helped you make that change in your life or in your thinking? I can go, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. <laughs> um, yes. So, uh, as I said before, I was not very well versed with empathy. But my adoptive parents taught me very well. Um, I was not easy to raise from 13 till 18 when they had me. I was um, technically a ward of the court as well, so the boundaries there are a little bit weird and kind of finicky, but that doesn't matter. Um, but my adoptive mom showed me repeatedly that she was not going anywhere, and it did not matter what I was going to do, but she wasn't going anywhere. And just her heart and her constantly constant reminder of that she doesn't understand where I came from but we're gonna change it we're gonna make it better I'm here for you that really taught me essentially empathy and how to experience that and what it feels like so that I can go and provide that for other people that was powerful. thank you uh, and for me oh. yes she did yeah <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was sobriety and harm reduction. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have six years sobriety. Yes. Uh, nice. Yeah, thanks. Great work. Uh, and I never asked for it. I never wanted it. Uh, I got conned into showing up at this tribal event uh, with the drum. And my therapist was like, oh, yeah, man, we're having this community drum, bro. Come on down. Gotcha. And my dumbass went. It was your intervention. <laughs> he goes, gotcha. <laughs> and we're sitting at this drum, and he says, uh, hey, this is a, a group to help men uh, with their struggles for sobriety with alcohol or drugs. Mm. And we passed this miguana around this feather. And I heard all my friends, they talk about their struggles. And I share this story not to be funny, but just kind of, Aaron kind of knows how I am. And uh, that feather came to me, eh? And I looked at all these dudes, eh, and their stories, and I looked at them, and I said, uh, you guys want me to quit because you're the shitty Indians that don't know how to control your liquor. Hey, I don't have the problem, bro. <laughs> and my therapist just kind of looked at me. <laughs> and uh, I share that because I made a light go off in my head, eh? We sang that first song, and that day while gone grabbed me. And so from that day forward is when I went sober. Mm. Nice. And I had friends, half the class that I grew up with are dead from overdose mm -hmm. or uh, from suicide up in Sault Ste. Marie. Mm -hmm. And I'd always, and my brothers were meth heads. And I used to tell my mom when we were speaking, man, hey, screw them dope heads, eh? Even my brothers, bro, they chose that, right? Hey, I never asked to be addicted to alcohol. I didn't grow up and tell my eighth grade teacher, hey, when I grow up, I'm going to be a drunken Indian on the res. I don't remember telling that answer. 
And so as I got more involved in the community and I started interacting with these people, I've never met a person that said, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a crackhead. When I grow up, I want to be a dopehead. When I grow up, I want to be houseless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are decisions that they made to, hey, remember when I said we're all dealing from something? Hey, healing? Mm -hmm. Hey, they're self-medicating or it's a coping mechanism, eh? Yeah. And it got them stuck in a rut, huh? And so instead of me being that dude that went around telling people, hey, you made bad life decisions and you deserve to sit in that and blah, blah, blah. You know what me and my partner did? We started in Oregon eh? and our oldest stepdaughter or my oldest stepdaughter. We do harm reduction. Mm -hmm. And we go and we teach harm reduction. And I work with the state. I sit on the state opioid task force on racial inequity. I work on the harm reduction summit. And so that, yeah, that did change me. Uh, for something good, uh, because I know that it wasn't just my community that was affected by these things that are involved in harm reduction. Hey, it was all people. All people. And every life matters, no matter how we save it. And if people aren't willing to stop, it's on us as a society to make sure that they're practicing the safest practices available to help spread the, the, the diseases, right? Help stop that spread. I mean, we can lead a horse to water and push its head down in the water unless that hurt horse is thirsty. It ain't drinking, bro. Sobriety is the same. And so, yeah, the thing that changed me was that, and that also allowed me to help meet people where they're at. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's the first pillar in harm reduction. That's great. Thank you for sharing. That's great, yeah. Trail, have another question. Did you have oh, I'm sorry, Trail. I was just going to add on to, like, a lifestyle change, you know, uh, post-COVID, you know, getting active, being fit, you know, that was my lifestyle change, not smoking weed, things of that nature. Um, but I had empathy in a different way. So for the people who want to get into a different lifestyle, want to change, want to be more active, I empathize with them because it's hard. It, it's tough. It's painful. Mm -hmm. So I always tell anybody who's trying to change in any way, just start. Just start. Yeah, it sounds like you guys are saying, you know, just start, make choices, put yourself in certain spaces, have conversation, allow people to love you. I mean, I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. Um, next question. Um, hi, so I have really appreciated everything around, like, agree to disagree and tolerance and things like that and boundaries. Um, can anyone speak to uh, accountability? And when do you choose to do accountability versus agreeing to disagree? Oh, how do you make those decisions when it's institutionally or interpersonally? Um, yeah. I feel like I can say something. I'll say, I'll say something. <laughs> very, I'll say something very personal. And that is um, when something, uh, say for instance, I needed someone to say tell give me an apology I really needed this person to apologize to me for perhaps years um, so and when I sat at the table with the person and uh, this is another thing my kids did for me my kids would allow me to sit at the table with people that maybe I would have not sat at the table with but I'm like okay I'm gonna give them a chance to meet my child and I'm gonna give them a chance to be in my child's life. And if they choose to love her or not, that's, you know, if they don't, if they're not in her life, then it's their loss. Well, this person in my family, I felt like I needed an, an apology from. And I was sitting at the table in a Mexican restaurant in Texas and I, and I couldn't take, um, I couldn't take the, the, the line of, of the train of thought that she was on, on uh, all of the things that she had done or all of the, and I was like, remember when you disowned me? Remember when you wrote me a letter in my, you know, the week of my finals in college and you said, you're not in my life, so don't be in my life and you disowned me. And then when you found out that I was having, that I was pregnant and having a child, then you decided, oh, everything, oh, everything's copacetic. I said, Remember when you disowned me and she said, well, I took a walk with Jesus and Jesus such and such and so forth. And I did not get that apology. And I had to just be 
okay with the fact that I was never going to receive that apology that I wanted so desperately from an important matriarch in my family. And, but ha finally being pushed up against that wall and having the guts to just say how I felt and say what I needed and say I need this <coughs> from you, that, that made me able to put the, that to rest. Mm -hmm. I was able to put that to rest and put that behind me yeah. instead of constantly worrying about it. I, say, I said I need this from you and they didn't give it to me. But just the fact that I was able to stand up for myself mm -hmm. and vocalize yeah. that, I was able to put that yeah. to rest. And I'm, I'm happy for you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So.